here we are in early October and we're looking forward to a freeze so it's about time to bring the gourds in. This is a Loki an Indian long gourd which is very edible in the early stages of its growth and this is the later stage of its growth and so we're bringing this in and we'll sun cure it for a while and then we'll get the seeds out. So here we are with the Loki harvest and this is the the African long gourd. The, uh, the family is the cucurbitaceae. That's the gourd family. The gourd family has about uh, very close to a hundred different genuses and almost a thousand different species and innumerable different cultivars. The gourds are among the oldest of cultigens, that is they've been uh, selected and utilized by human beings longer than uh, most types of plants. The oldest archaeological evidence of the use of gourds is in Mesoamerica and South America and dates back about 10,000 years to uh, early settlements in the New World. So gourds actually have their gene center in Africa. So how did they get to South America? Well, they probably floated transcontinentally and and uh, were picked up on the beach and replanted by people in South America, then there's very little archeological evidence for gourds in Africa, but there's an ongoing tradition of using gourds for carrying liquids in Africa. The Maasai uh, people use these, these kinds of gourds, these long gourds, once they're cured out and they hang them by their, the side of their uh, belt and fill them with uh, water or with sort of like Maasai cheese, which is cow's blood mixed with, with um, cow's milk. And they walk uh, many, many kilometers in the Rift Valley just, just uh, using the, the resources in the gourd or the resources in the, that are uh, in, the, in the cheese. So, it occurs to me that gourds are probably pretty significant in terms of the African diaspora, the, the movement of peoples out of the uh, African continent and into, the, into uh, uh, the Mediterranean region and into Europe and Scandinavia uh, across into the New World. Um, you, have to, you have to have water in order to move and so the uh, filling of a gourd with water is one good way to do it. You can also use an animal skin or a camel's bladder, but the water tastes better when you uh, work with it out of a gourd. So these uh, are still green, and I'm not going to cut them open yet because they're still after ripening. The, the uh, seeds that are in there are inside the what we call the spaghetti the matrix that's inside all of uh, the, the uh, gourds, melons, bitter melons, jaugulan, snake gourds, trichosanthes, uh, pumpkins, all of these are related plants that are right inside that gourd family, the cucurbitaceae. Some people call it the cucurbits but then it starts to sound kind of like a breakfast cereal. So I generally call it the gourd family. One more thing about Loki. This is the Indian long gourd and it could easily, just as easily be called the African long gourd. But you pick them when they're very immature, unripe and small. So they're only like about that tall when you actually pick them for culinary purposes. And then they're sliced up and stir fried. And the culinary concept is that you have something that is absorptive. It stays firm even when you cook it. And then uh, it absorbs 
all of the different chilies and uh, uh, curry powder and so forth that go along with the cooking. So it absorbs the flavors, although it has really no flavor all on its own. And, uh, and this is a uh, uh, good medicinal herb as well. So it is anti-cholesterol emic, which means uh, it basically reduces the uh, bad cholesterol in your bloodstream, the LDL cholesterol. And it is uh, loaded with vitamin C and you don't necessarily have to eat an orange to get vitamin C. You can get vitamin C from a lot of different places. So it has a significant amount of vitamin C and also potassium. And potassium is the good salt. Um, uh, fruits and vegetables that are high in potassium are really good for you. So the Loki, it's L-A-U-K-I. The Loki gourd is something that you can grow and incorporate into your cooking. You'll get uh, more vitamin C, which is has antioxidant uh, potential and um, basically, basically helps you keep from getting sick. Uh, and you also get the potassium and the anti-cholesteremic effects of the herb. Here's, here are a few examples of other types of gourds. Gourds, as you know, are Lagenaria cicerarea. And they come in lots of different shapes. This is a rattle gourd shape. has the long handle and you can fill that up with, with pea gravel and close it off and then you get a rattle. This is a drinking gourd that uh, was... Uh, Actually, I purchased it in the market in Kisi, in Kenya, and then later on I apprenticed to a, a Kikuyu gourd carver who learned his skills by looking at the displays in the National Museums of Kenya and uh, uh, scores, scores the, the gourd with a knife and then rubs um, oil and charcoal into the into the scores to make a pattern and so I I, uh, I received this from the woman in the in the market and she wasn't going to sell it to me actually until I agreed to take a drink from it so I took a a good drink and it was uh, um, sour milk and she carefully watched my face to see how I would how I would react and I reacted well and so she was willing to s sell it to me for a couple of shillings i think it was her favorite gourd and now it's my favorite gourd too do you want to see up close the markings there's a kind of a rhinoceros elephant type of creature and then there's a little guy there and he's got a aloe plant that is si similar to my African experience. I was a little guy with a beard and long hair and an aloe plant. Speaking of Africa, let's go on to the next gourd family plant that we're going to look at, which is the um, African horned cucumber. So that's right over here. Here we have just sort of a dry bed in the garden where um, we cleared out the weeds and tilled early in the spring. And then I just came and pushed in some seeds for the African horned cucumber, which is uh, Cucumus zambianus. It's, it's from northwestern Zambia. It's a uh, traditional plant that grows there and it's used by the farmers in that area as a source for proteinaceous seeds and water, which is very uh, precious. You call it Zambianus, not Zambianus. Zambianus means something else. Don't use that term. And here we go with the, the um, vines. If I pick up the vines, you can see the, the fruits hanging. And as they yellow, 
they become they, that indicates that they're more and more ripe. And with any of the cucurbits, when the stem begins to dry off, that means that the seeds are ripe. And that is a good indicator for like um, when to harvest watermelons, which are, as you know, Cucumus citrullus. The different kinds of watermelon are all the same Latin, but there are lots of different cultivars. There's moon and stars, and there's sugar baby, all Citrullus, luna, luna, uh, Citrullus species. So then, here is our horned cucumber. Wipe it off a little bit so it's pretty, and get a, can you get a close up on that? So then when we cut it, now when you cut gourds and, and um, cucumbers and so forth, if you want to save the seeds, you always cut from the stem down to the base, not this way. Because when you do it that way, then you don't cut the seeds in half because the seeds are, are oriented in such a way that you get a better preservation of the seeds if you cut it laterally. And then on the inside, there's the uh, spaghetti and then the seeds. And the seeds are quite deliciously edible. The spaghetti is edible. And you can see how much liquid there is there as opposed to the very dry bed that this is coming from. And so as the globe warms, we need to think more and more about more plants that produce fruits, that preserve water, and can fend off starvation for people who live in very arid environments. Let's go into the field and find another gourd family plant. This one uh, from more northern Europe and it is uh, the cucurbita papo, the, the uh, pumpkin. So let's look at that. Pumpkins are cucurbita papo, and this is the Styrian pumpkin, which is the source of naked seeded pumpkin seeds. And again, when you start to see the top die back, which it really hasn't done, but on these, actually, if you start to get a, a yellowness to it, then it's ready. The flesh of this pumpkin is not so much used. I mean, you can make it into pumpkin pie or pumpkin soup or or you can feed it to the goats, but it's it's not really as good as um, as a pie pumpkin or as a red curry squash for the purpose. And uh, mainly what these are used for is for the so I don't eviscerate myself here, is for the naked seeds, which are edible and have a lot of vitamin E. They also um, are a good treatment for BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy, which is swelling of the male glands and there you go there's the there's the inside of the pumpkin and these are the naked seeds right inside the spaghetti see as as cucurbits mature what happens is the seeds actually suck up the resources of the spaghetti. And so you can see these long strands, they're connected directly to the seed and the seed is nursing on them. Just like a little baby nursing on milk. These can be dried and eaten as is, or they can be briefly oven roasted with salt and they make a great trail mix and they're highly nutritious and will last for at least a year in storage. 
So this is a good protein source for the temperate garden because it's easy to grow pumpkins and the pumpkins produce these very delicious seeds that have no holes on them so you don't have to peel it before you eat it. Styrian pumpkin. So here we have the wild buffalo gourd. Those of you that live in the American Southwest will recognize it as a roadside weed. It has these sort of trowel shaped leaves. Very characteristic and smells uh, slightly fetid. So the Latin name is uh, Cucumus fetidissima or the foul smelling cucumber. And then Buffalo gourd is one of the common names. There's one of the gourds right there. They're really pretty. They're a source of plant saponins. And so these are traditionally used for making the soap and they can be uh, cut this way and used for scrubbing the floor. Like that. Those are free floor scrubbing sponges and what we could do is we could do a little experiment we could take some of the internal parts of this and put it in a jar with some water and shake it up and see if we get any suds so let's do that i took the buffalo gourd i cut it up a little bit scooped out some of the innards and put it in water and now we're going to shake it to see if we get any saponin reaction and sure enough we're making soap and so this is, uh, in medicinal herbs, saponins are known to uh, dispel toxins. And so you have something like chickweed that you take in the spring that helps dispel the toxins of winter. It's full of saponins. And uh, um, I'm thinking now of another cucumber family plant or a gourd family plant that is called trichosanthes. It's the snake gourd. And that uh, is very famous for dispersing toxins. So we're gonna go look at that next, right after we wash the floor. The um, snake gourds, the trichosanthes curuloei, right uh, on the edge of the shade house where we do the potting up for our plants to crawl up and go over and create additional shade, which was much appreciated this summer. So not only uh, can the gourd family plants give us water in the off season, but they can also give us shade during the middle of the summer. Then uh, gourds have male and female flowers. Sometimes they occur on the same plant. Sometimes they occur on separate plants. When they occur on separate plants, they're known as dioecious plants, ma separate male and female plants. And so that is the case with the trichosanthes. They are uh, separate male and female plants. And here's one of the, one of the gourds has poked through a flower, a flower, a female flower came through and then now it's, it's, uh, maturing right outside the shade cloth so we can work on it from this side, which is really kind of cool. Here's the, the uh, dried inflorescence. And you can always tell the female flowers because they have a, like a mini, a mini gourd underneath them. The male flowers don't have any, uh, any uh, fruit hanging down, whereas the female flowers do. And so we'll give this a cut it's still it's still quite green but usually these have a pretty nice color so i thought i'd show you that there's the extraordinary color of the spaghetti on the trichosanthes and this is one of the uh chinese herbs that spells heat and so it's used as an anti-tussive for treating uh, cough and especially when the cough is 
uh, accompanied by a yellow phlegm or a yellow sputum. When people come to me with a cough, I often ask them, well, what, you know, what color is your spit? And if they say that it's clear, then a lot of times that's they're, they're having a cough because they're allergic to something. But if it's a yellow sputum, then that means that there's infection involved. And so you need to disperse that infection. And, and this is a, sort of a doctrine of signatures. The, the yellow uh, spaghetti is like the yellow sputum. And in Chinese uh, uh, herbs, you get different names for different herbs that are all from the same plant. And this is the case, there are three different uh, Chinese herbs made out of the snake gourd. Uh, one of them is the, is the seed, just the seed itself. One of them is the internal pith, the pith, the spaghetti. And one of them is the uh, dried rind. So you have three, three, three herbs in one. Here's the snake gourd, the Trichosanthes curuloei, that's gone feral and has climbed up this cedar tree. Everywhere in the Garden of Medicinal Herbs you have these kinds of relationships where one plant creates a carbonaceous structure for another plant and together they do better than they would do separately. I'm using this as an opportunity to plug my new book, Growing Plant Medicine. We're here with another of the cucurbits, the, the uh, gourd family, and this is the squirting cucumber, which is really a lot of fun. It's also a medicinal herb. The Latin is ecbolium elitarium, and the use is as a laxative, a strong laxative. It uh, contains this compound known as elaterin, which is a, a, a strong purgative. So uh, growing plant medicine is really kind of a tome and it covers a lot of these medicinal herbs. It has a chapter on the cucurbitaceae, the gourd family. And so you see here the photo is, or the drawing is of squirting cucumber and shows the cucumber in the uh, in the act of squirting and 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 issuing its seeds in this long ejaculation it's very difficult to get a picture of this a single picture of it so hopefully in this video we'll be able to disturb one of the fruits enough so that we get a uh, a, a picture of the seeds actually squirting out of the uh, fruit and this is known as elastic energy uh, the same as like when you blow up a balloon and let it go and it flies all over the room that's elastic energy because as the as the elastic reduces in volume then it expulses something in this case air or in this case here seeds and the elaterin which is the medicinal part i've tried to really cover a lot with these monographs in the book and it's extensive. It has hundreds of herbs in it. Uh, but but uh, I've also tried to like put in a little bit of poetry and that sort of thing just to kind of lighten things up a little bit. And so that's in the italics at the beginning underneath the common and the Latin name. You'll see uh, maybe a story or a poem. So the poem for cu uh, squirting cucumber is the squirting cucumber friend of ant and bee suffers not its seeds to slumber, ejects them by way of elastic energy. A French doctor at Jardin de Plantes stored the stuff in the band of his hat, dared not stop for a croissant, had to hurry to la toilette. So here we are at the plant, and I thought I would demonstrate how to collect the seeds. See, it is late in the season, so the plant is not really at its, at its best. All these stubs here are actually uh, fruits that have already flown off. And when they do, they exp expunge their seeds. Here's a seed right here resting on a, a, a partially desiccated leaf. 
and so the seeds will really end up anywhere and uh, in terms of natural farming techniques you watch what happens to the seeds in nature and then you mimic that to uh, cultivate the plant in domestic culture so what happens here is the seeds end up see there are some right there actually there's one right there they end up on the um, on the gravel and then they gravitate down through the gravel and they end up on the mineral soil they germinate there and then they send up uh, seedling through the gravel again so that would be a good way to grow them another uh, point about this is that uh, um, the plant needs intense drainage it exists in nature around the shores of the Mediterranean where there are calcareous soils and well-drained soils and also that uh, it is a uh, um, indeterminate vine that is the the plant just continues to grow and continues to to uh, establish itself it never stops until it's stopped by frost at that point it senesces back down to the crown people tell me all the time oh my squirting cucumber died or my echinacea plant died they don't die this is natural for them in the fall to senesce back down to the crown they're just going to sleep don't say that they're dead that's really bad karma for you so and it's wrong so uh, it will reawaken in the spring it makes male and female flowers on the same plant so separate male and female flowers but on the same plant and so these fruits then are going to be at, at the site where there was a female flower and I'm going to start to like mess with this a little bit and see what happens are you right in on it as close as you can get so this one looks a little salty so it must be close to getting ready to ejaculate and there it went ah that was really satisfactory did you catch it I think so awesome okay so what else can we say well we're here in the environment the uh, way to collect the elaterin is to use a piece of cloth and to actually train the uh, expulsion of the the seeds and the and the elaterin onto the cloth then you pick off the seeds you dry the cloth in the sun and then rub it like this and the flakes of elaterin come off a little dab will do you so here we are there are a couple more fruits over here and we can demonstrate the way to harvest the elaterin first of all when you open this up keep it pointed towards the cloth because when it goes there's no stopping it so those seeds are a little bit immature but there's the elaterin right there and here's another one oh okay so that's the way you produce elaterin you're going to let this dry in the sun and then flex it and those flakes will come off of there and that is the medicinal aspect in the fast draining area we can grow a few other plants that are pretty showy here's a belladonna that's a tropa belladonna and there's the berry there that uh, you can see your own karma in that berry if you if you gaze at it long enough then another related plant in the solanacea this is uh, mandragora turcomonica and this is an example of how we create environment for uh, uh, specific medicinal plants. These have a very long tap root, so we've built a, a deep flat here. And these were planted as seedlings last year, and this one is another year older, and it's actually in flower right now. If, Zach, if you move around this way, you can probably get a close-up of the flower, which is just epic. See that purple flower in there? See if you can get in on that. So all of this is just to inspire you 
to diversify your cultivation of medicinal herbs. Learn some things that you haven't learned before. See some plants that are new. Find out how they act, what you can do for them, and what they'll do for you in return. Uh, growing Plant Medicine is available on Amazon. It's available at the Strictly Medicinal Seeds website, www.strictlymedicinalseeds.com. And it's also available at herbalreads.com. Shipping from uh, Herbal Reads and from the website at Strictly Medicinal Seeds is free. Shipping from Amazon costs. So please uh, keep it close to home and tie into Strictly Medicinal Seeds or Herbal Reads and get yourself a copy. I'll sign it for you. Thanks. Wash the floor, wash the floor. This is the way we wash the floor so early in the morning. Wash, wash, wash the floor. This is the way we scrub the floor. Scrub the floor, scrub the floor. This is the way we scrub the floor so early in the morning. Scrub, scrub, scrub the floor. It's going to take a little more.